afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session. And today's session is on SQL. And as you all know, SQL is one of those fundamental aspect of data analysis. Everyone is expected to know SQL. It's it's even of a higher significance the more you want to go into more sophisticated tooling. So the more you want to do data engineering, use Power BI, use more sophisticated tools, people expect you to know SQL. They just have it as a as something that um, you should know. They don't even when they don't put it in the requirements. They believe that you should know how to pull data from SQL. So today. We are fortunate to have Akim with us to present, take us on one of the, another key aspect of SQL, stored procedure. So today you'll be learning about uh, stored procedure in SQL. And I will talk a bit about our presenter. So this session is brought to you by Your Biz Edge and MHS Analytics. Your Biz Edge is a Nigerian Microsoft Excel, Power BI, Financial Modeling, SQL, Python, training and consulting company and so if you need training or you require consulting services feel free to reach out to us i'm going to share this link where you can access some of our free resources and some paid resources too so uh, it's a mix if you only want the free resources then great if you are doing the financial modeling exam you will find our free mock exam useful for you i'll share this link and MHS Analytics is a Canadian entity servicing the North American market. The same services, just a different clientele, and some of them actually require slightly different um, services. But it's what we offer in Nigeria, we offer here, what we offer here, we can offer in Nigeria, even when customer requests are different across the two markets. And uh, to our speaker, uh, his name is Akim Manibi. He works with your Biz Edge. He's a data analyst with experience across different sectors, including health insurance, real estate, and mining. He's adept at using data analysis tools, including Excel, Power BI, SQL, which he will be presenting to us on today, and Python. And I will share his LinkedIn in the chat so that you can connect with him. Right now, we hand over to him so that he takes charge of the session. If you have any questions, you can put in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat and calling his attention to them. Uh, so Akim, over to you. Um, all right, thank you, Michael. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone once again. So uh, I'm just on my screen. All right, so we're going to be looking at um, Beginner's Guide to Stored Procedures in SQL. So I'm actually sure that at some point, we'll have probably found ourselves writing the same complex queries over and over again. Maybe you're a sales data analyst, and then you have to retrieve some sales record, maybe monthly, weekly, or quarterly, or yearly. For, for, our, for your organization, rather. Then you have to write the same query all over again, repeatedly. So I actually bring you good news. You can actually um, use a stored procedures just to save or store your query in um, your database. And then whenever you need it, all you have to do is just call up on it and then you execute it. So moving on. Um, So agenda today, we're going to be looking at what stored procedures are, why they're actually important. Um, we're going to see how we can create a basic stored procedure, how we can execute or call upon a stored procedure that we've written and saved in our database, how we can modify an existing stored procedure, how we can rename an existing stored procedure, what parameters are and how we can actually use parameters in stored procedure. Then last, okay, we're going to see how we can also delete the stored procedure. And lastly, we're going to see how we can, uh, we're going to see the best practices for writing efficient stored procedures in SQL. So firstly, what is a stored procedure? So a stored procedure is just a pre-written SQL query that you write 
and then store in your database, and then you can call upon it at any time that we need it. Just like as I mentioned earlier. So we actually use, or we often use the procedure for packs or um, things that are done repeatedly. So instead of you repeating an action multiple times, you can just save your time for that stress of writing a very long query, which can be sometimes annoying. But then you have it saved in your database and then you call upon it whenever you need it. So um, why are stored procedures actually important in SQL? So we all know, as Michael mentioned earlier, a lot of people use SQL, data analysts, data scientists, um, software engineers, and then everyone who use um, SQL or interacts with database in general. Um, stuff procedure is actually important or is a very necessary or, yeah, a very necessary tool to know and to use. So the very first advantage of stored procedure is the reusability. So this is like the very key or the most important advantage of using stored procedure. It actually also eliminates that need of um, writing a query multiple times. Just like as I mentioned earlier, you're a sales data analyst in an organization, and then you're, you have a task to retrieve the sales record every week or every month or quarterly or yearly, you can just store your um, query in your DB, then call upon it at any time that you need it. So we have um, parameters acceptance. So we have something called parameters in SQL, which we are going to be looking at later on today in this session. So um, SQL actually accepts parameter inputs that can actually help us customize the um, behavior or the or help, help us manipulate the result of our query. So also we have logic and control flow, just like as we have in other um, programming languages that we have the if statements like in Python, like we have um, the if statements in, um, in Excel also. So we can actually use the if statements, you can use conditional statement like the if statements, the loops, the while loops also in um, start procedures to help us manipulate our data set or sorry, our result rather. So we're just going to add in to um, SSMS against using SQL Server to um, explore start procedures against making use of um, the um, AdventureWorks database. I will just drop a link or two in the chat box. Sorry. All right, this is a blog that can help us understand how we can install or import the adventure database into our DB. And there's also a YouTube. Um, there is a YouTube video that I can also watch to help install the DB. Sorry. To help import the DB into All right, so we'll just dive right in. So the very first thing is to create a start procedure. So to create a start procedure, we use the command create procedure. So this helps us in the creation of our procedure. And then we give our procedure a name. In my own instance, I'll give it a name. I'll say maybe SP, which means I'm um, Start procedure and you can say webinar. So um, it's, it's very, very advisable to always use a very descriptive name whenever we are naming our start procedure. And after we've done this, the next thing is to use the alias, that is the as command, to signify that we want to start or the beginning of the procedure that we're trying to create. Afterwards, we can begin with the begin block, although this is, this is quite optional, but it is very important if you are having batches of queries or batches of um, statements in our procedure. So to begin 
a particular batch of um a, a, a particular batch of a query you can use the begin to signify that this is the beginning of this um query afterwards we can just put in our query and then in our case now we're going to be making use of the processing table in the adventure works db The person table is located in the person schema. So let's just explore it a bit and see what we have in the table. So we have the business entity ID, we have the person type, we have the name style, title, column, the first name column, the middle, the middle name column, you have the last name column, you have the suffix also. So we're just going to write a very simple query to extract or to retrieve the first name, the middle name, the last name and also the suffix of these people. So we we'll start. We we'll say select, as we all know, and select the first name, and select the middle name column, and select the last name column, and also the suffix column. And all of this will be coming from the person table. You can just drag and drop in. Then this is our little query. And we can end this query or this batch of query using the end command over here. So one other thing is we can actually specify the DB that we want this touch procedure to get saved in. In my case, I want it to get saved in the AdventureWorks database and not the master database as we have over here. So I'll use the use command and I'll say use AdventureWorks 2022. But we'll notice the IntelliSense is actually underlining this as read. That is because whenever we want to create a procedure, the very first statement has to be the create procedure statement. If not, it's going to return an error. And that is because we have the use statement over here. So let's just test it. You can see it is actually returning an error, just like I said. And to actually overcome this, you can just add the go statement over here. And you can see the IntelliSense red line has gone off. So we just execute this, you can use the F5 key on our keyboard, or we can come over here to execute. So we have a new result that says command completed successfully. That means this little query that we saved in our procedure has been saved or stored in our DB, in the AdventureWorks DB. And you can come over to the Object Explorer. Let's refresh and then expand our DB. And you can actually see the start procedure you just created in the programmability file. And you can expand the start procedure. And this is it over here. dbu.sp underscore webinar. And um, by default, I should have mentioned this earlier, by default, if we don't specify a schema that we want this thought procedure to get saved in. By default, it's going to get saved in the default schema, which is DBU. DBU actually means um, database owner. So you're just going to get saved in this database. So in this schema, rather, the DBU schema. All right, so we'll just move on to the next agenda. So we've created this thought procedure, just like as we have it here. What about if you want to call upon this thought procedure when exactly when we need it. So there are several ways to actually execute or to call upon a thought procedure. Um, the very first thing or the very first method is we can use a query, you can say execute, and the name of our procedure is um sp underscore webinar. And then 
as a kitchen that it has returned the first name column, the middle name column, the last name column, and also the suffix column that we actually imputed in our stored procedure over here while we are creating a stored procedure over here. And um, one other method is just highlight this and um, execute. And then it does the same work for us. Um, the very last method is to come over here to our stored procedure file, locate the stored procedure. You can right click on it and then see execute stored procedure. Now you're going to get this window, or you're still going to get over here later on. So it's actually asking if there's, assuming there was a parameter in our stored procedure, we're going to see it over here, but we don't have a parameter in this particular stored procedure. So just click on OK. And then it has returned the same results for us. So um, you can use any method that you see to be very um, convenient for you. So now I've actually created a stored procedure. What about if the management comes tomorrow and then says, oh, we need to add a particular column to a stored procedure or to that particular query that you've stored in, a, in, the, in the DB. So you can actually modify or alter is an existing stored procedure. Let me squeeze this. All right. So by changing this creates over here to alter, so we can alter this third procedure that we've created earlier by changing the creates to alter. This is the very first method. And then we can alter the query by saying we want to add a title column. And then we execute. So the title column has been added to a stored procedure. So let's check it out again. Let's see what we have. Execute SP underscore webinar. So this is the title column over here that has been added to our query. One other method is to come over here to our object explorer. You can right click on it and then select the modify option. Then we can edit over here. Let's assume you want to just remove the suffix column. Maybe the management doesn't need the suffix column anymore. So we can just remove that over here. And then we execute. So let's go back and um, call upon our start procedure once again and let's confirm the change that we made so we're going to execute this guy again we execute and then you can see the suffix column has been deleted or has been removed from our procedure so we'll move on to our next agenda, which is um, parameters. What parameters are in um, stored procedure? So as I mentioned earlier, so parameters are just the inputs that we can provide in our stored procedure to help us manipulate the result of our procedure or to customize it in a way that is going to befit the purpose that we need it for. So to create a parameter in um, a stored procedure, because this is an existing stored procedure, we are still going to leave it as author procedure. Then after the name of the procedure, I'll just go to my next to the next line, and then to create a parameter, we can start by using the at, and this time around, we want to create a parameter. Okay, we let's remove the suffix over here also. So once create a parameter that is going to filter our query, it's going to filter the title column in our query. So we can just give this parameter a very reasonable and descriptive name. So we say title, 
And whenever we are creating a parameter, we need to add the data type of this parameter. So this is just telling the SQL that, okay, this parameter, I want it to accept an integer data type, or I want it to accept a voucher, or I want it to accept a date value. So in our case now, a title is a voucher, is a string value. So just say title as voucher, and then we indicate the number of characters that we want this parameter or that we want it to accept. So we just say it's a title, so we want it to accept nothing more than five characters. Then to filter our query, we all know we can use or we use the where statement to filter the results of our query. So we're going to add the where statement over here. And we'll say where the title column is across to whatever we put in a parameter. You can see it has identified the parameter over here. So moving on, we can just execute this to save the change. And we can see the command has been completed successfully. So let's execute this parameter. So we can actually execute it just like we did earlier. So to execute this parameter, sorry, this um, stock procedure as a parameter, we need to add the input over here. So we're going to say at type two, that's the, is across to, we only use a string, so we can see, we want to check out for the um, people in this organization that have the type two mister. So we've added that to our parameter and execute. And then it has returned just results of those with the type two mister, as you can see in our results. Right. So as I said earlier, if we don't add um, the parameter input is going to return an error for us. So let's try that and see. We execute and you can see it has returned an error saying it's expecting a parameter at title which was not supplied. So as I mentioned, parameter just also is manipulate or customize the results that we get. As you mean, we want to see those with misses or miss. In our query, we execute this. You can see it has also returned those people with tied to MS and full stop. We have four and five people. So we can actually have multiple, um, we can have multiple parameters in a stored procedure. So I can add another parameter named um, first name. So what this first name parameter is going to do for us is is going to return there is is going to return those whose first name is like the first name we are imputing. So this is also going to be a voucher. And then we say we want it to be um, maybe like 20 characters or thereabouts. And we can come over here and then impute or indicate that this is how we want this parameter to behave. So over here, we want, it, we want to use the AND function and then we'll call upon this column, the first name column. Where the first name column is like, um, so we know whenever we are using the like um, function in SQL, we often use wildcards with it. And for example, just like this, we want to see those whose um, first name starts with J. We know we always have it like this. 
But whenever we want to use the parameter and then indicates that we want it to be like this, for example, first name. Excel is sorry, I said Excel. SQL is going to recognize this as at first name. It's going to recognize it as a string of its own. It's not going to recognize it as a parameter. So one thing we can do is to concatenate and then we say um, we're going to add we say the first name parameter plus the word card, the percentage word card. So this is going to return a value for any parameter that we put here that is starting that particular first name. So let's execute this and give it a try. Yeah? Computer successfully. Then to call upon this particular stored procedure, we we'll add the new um, parameter. We we'll say at first name. Is equals to um, maybe let's say G. This is a string, so it has to be quoted. So you can execute. Then you can see our result matching both values. As we know that the AND function is going to ensure that all the conditions are met. So over here, the condition we gave it was that the title has to be Miss, and then the first name has to start with the letter G. So it has returned results for people with the title MS dot, and then the first name is starting with the letter G. Likewise, we can actually edit this to ensure that um, the last name is going to end with the letter G and not begin with letter J. So I can manipulate this, bring our word card forward, and then add the parameter behind it. So let's execute this. So it has been successfully. So let's execute a stock procedure once again. OK, so we don't have anyone whose first name ends with the letter G. We can still manipulate this, this query to ensure that anyone whose first name has a J in it is going to return such person for us. So we just concatenate again and then Add a word card, the percentage word card. And execute this again. Completed successfully. Then call upon a start procedure. So you can see it has returned results of those whose first name has a J in it. So you can see for row 37. Person has a G in the second to the last character. So we've seen how we can um, create a procedure, how we can execute it, how we can alter, and then how we use parameter. So as I said earlier, there are different ways of executing a stored procedure by using the query or by highlighting. In this case, it's not going to work because we have parameters in a stored procedure. I need to identify so we can't just highlight. So one other thing is we can come over here, right click, modify. Oh, sorry. Went execute. So now we are going to create or supply the parameter values over here. And then we want it to be Mrs. or Miss rather. Then the first name should be maybe A. So one of the thing I want us to notice here is we are not quoting the values are supplying here. That is because um, SQL has actually recognized this 
to be a virtual, which is a string. So we don't need to just give it some single quote or anything. So we can say OK. I can see it has returned the people with A in their name, and also their title is Miss. So I guess look at how we can rename our stored procedure. And there are two ways to this. We can actually use a query. Rename. So you can say call out the command sp underscore rename. And then the parameter, sorry, the stop procedure we want to rename, we're going to give or supply the old name. In our case, it is sp underscore webinar. And we have to ensure the name is quoted because it is string. Then the new name we want to give this stop procedure, we're going to supply it. We can just say maybe um proc underscore webinar. So the very first thing you're supplying is the old or the initial name. And then the next thing you're supplying is the new name that wants to give the stop procedure. So let's execute this. So that's completed successfully, but it's actually returned the question saying if you change any part of um, the name, it could break the scripts or the stop procedure. So why in our object explorer, let's um, refresh it once again to see the change we made. So we're going to expand. Go to programmability, start procedure. And then you can see the name has changed from SP underscore webinar, as we had earlier, to PROC underscore webinar. So it is the very first way of um, changing or renaming a stop procedure. You can also come over to the Object Explorer over here and um, right click, you see the rename option, and then you can just easily rename a stop procedure. So deleting a stop procedure also, there are two ways to go about it. Just like as we know, we can right click over here and then delete, right click the delete option and then it gets deleted from our DB. Or you can also use a query. So to delete a procedure or a start procedure rather, we say we use the command drop procedure. And the name of the procedure we are dropping now is the proc underscore webinar procedure. So as a kitten, this is going to delete this top procedure entirely or totally from a DB. So I'm sure you'd be wondering why we often use or why we, we have to write code to delete or rename or execute and so on. When we can just come over here. So just right click and then um, modify or to rename or anything. So the major importance of actually writing a query is when we have a very complex um, query and then based on our if statement based on how we want it to get, um, how we want to customize our stored procedure. So, for example, now we are using an if statement. We know if statement is a conditional statement. So, when a condition is met, we can just want it to automatically delete a stored procedure or to rename it or do any other um, stuff with. The stop procedure. So that is like the major importance or the advantage of writing such um, query for renaming and also 
to delete a state procedure. So we're moving to our very last agenda, which is the best practices for writing efficient state procedure. So the very first thing, or the very first best practice, is to ensure that the name of the procedure is very descriptive, as I mentioned earlier. You can't be giving it a name that is not very descriptive. It's not going to make, um, it's not going to be so meaningful to any other person aside you. And even after a very long time that you've written a third procedure and you don't give it a very reasonable name, and when you're looking for that procedure and you want to execute it, you just keep trying several stock procedure because you did not just give it a very descriptive name. So the very second best practice is to write clear and um, well commented SQL code within the stock procedure. So this is actually helps other people want to read and understand your stock procedure. It's actually very important to add comments so SQL code, whenever you're writing SQL code, not only for um for stored procedure, but generally whenever you're writing our SQL queries, is there is um advisable to use comments. So another best practice is to utilize indentation to improve the code structure and readability. If you notice earlier, while I was writing my stored procedure, I ensured I used indentations whenever it's needed. So for example, now I use the indentation over here. So anyone who picks up this top procedure and wants to um, modify it will see that, okay, this is the beginning of the query and this is the end of the query. And what we have here are the parameters Available in this top procedure. Sorry, can you hear me? All right. So we can actually just come over here and then expand the parameters um folder. Sorry. Wow, yeah, just to see the parameters that we have in this stored procedure. So moving on to the next best practice. So there is actually, there is good to use parameters in our stored procedure instead of add coding values within the stored procedure. So this is just to improve flexibility and um, easy manipulation or customization of the results that we get from this third procedure. And also, we have to avoid using the select asterisk to retrieve uh, results. This is because it slows down the performance of our query. So instead of just using the select asterisk, we can just specify the columns that we need to see in our results. Then second to the last um, practice is to use the where clause just to filter the data that we need, instead of calling out all the data or all the records that we have in our table, we can just use the where clause just to get the specific data that we need to see in our results. And also, lastly, it's always advisable to use temporary tables in our start procedure. Although in subsequent sessions, we are going to be exploring our dive a bit deeper in start procedure in coming sessions, we can see how we can use temporary tables, um, the loop, sorry, the while loops, the if statement and so on. So it's actually very advisable to use temporary tables in our start procedures. And um, one other thing is we should actually be very careful while using temporary tables in our procedure because they actually consume um, the memory in our DB and probably sometimes slow down the performance of um, of the query in general. So with this, um, I think we've come to the end of the session. Thank you everyone for listening. Please, if you have any questions, 
you can just um, drop them in the chat box. Oh yeah, so um, I can see one. See, so, yeah, um, can joins be used when creating stock procedures? Yes, very well. We can actually use joins in our queries whenever we're using stock procedures. And we can even utilize that. Let's try that. So let's try to manipulate what we have here. So you can use a join. <coughs> So let's just join two tables. Let's look for another table that we can use over here. So I think we can use the employee table. All right, so just get the job title of this employee using connecting both tables using the business entity ID. So let's go back to our query. So we want to join employee table want to get the job title uh, joining this on so let's give this an alias let's say as p as e so we are p that business entity id is across to E this business entity ID. Oh sorry, we changed the name earlier. And we also deleted it. So we can just create it once again. Let me see, do you still have it over here? Okay, we still have it over here. So let's just alter. So let's execute what we have here. So we are changing the name to so you can see it has returned just this for us. So you can see joins actually work perfectly fine in start procedure. So I think I've been able to answer your question. So any other person, please? Thanks, and then that's even an opportunity for us to highlight the SQL courses we have and the one that uh, we recently had it. So maybe if you want to click on the course that you've created on our course platform and then just tell people what they will learn oh, yeah. for those who are interested in taking this knowledge further and taking a proper course. Okay. Oh no, this is wrong one. Uh, they, if you click on, I posted two. Okay. Oh, I yeah. think I copied the wrong one. All right. Um. So there is a course that was just recently published on um class.bzh.com. It's the name is a mastering SQL for data analysis. So in this course, we're going to see how to install the um, the SQL server and then the SSMS. Just a little introduction to SQL for data analysis. So we see how we can actually create a relational database from scratch ourselves. So we see how we can retrieve information from our DB which is database querying. So furthermore, we see how we can use several operators in SQL, the AND operator like I used earlier, the OR operator, the IN operator, the NOT SEEN operator, the BETWEEN operator, 
the like operator just like we did earlier, just like we used it earlier. Then we can also, we're going to see how to use the case statement in SQL. Also, we in the course, you see, you learn about how you can combine data in SQL using the inner join, left join, right join, the full join, and also how you can create, uh, sorry, how you can combine data using set operations like the union, union or intercept and accept. Then also in the course, you see how to make use of subqueries, CTEs, um, the differences between subqueries and CTEs, and then the different um, scenarios where we can use subquery, either in the select statement or in the from clause or in the where clause to filter the result of the um, of our query. Then we can see how we can then also in the course we see how to format the results of our query using the text formatting like the L trim, left trim, chat index, substring, and um, so on. Or we can also also format numbers either as currency, as percentage. Several currencies we can use. Um, we can format it as a dollar. To have the dollar sign, or to have the naira sign, to have the Ghana city sign, or any other currency that you want to use. So you can see how we can also format dates, how we can extract these components, maybe the day, the name, the year, how we can format it to have just the name or the day of the week, or just have um, the month as, um, how do I put it? I also have the month name, right? Yeah, I also have the month name and not just the month number. And also in the course, you also learn how to use stored procedure in SQL. And we talked about a few best practices in SQL in general. So the course is actually very good for anyone who is trying to upskill or a beginner also, no matter the no matter your knowledge or your level of knowledge of SQL, the course is actually very um, educative, informative, and very interesting also. Yeah, thanks. And uh, just to mention, I know some of you will have seen prices in dollars in there. Uh, for everyone in Nigeria, obviously, there's the option to pay in Naira if Akim goes back there and he expands the payment plan, you'll see that we included yeah. an option that allows people to uh, pay in Naira. I think if you do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think we even made it cheaper than the typical conversion rate. So uh, there are multiple ways you can take your knowledge forward if you think SQL is critical for you to learn. And as you can see from the demonstration of today, the maybe I'll give an, a, a a kind of scenario that I have had to that I'm thinking on now and seeing that I could have used thought procedure you know so in my current contract with a particular big client every quarter we need to do reports in Power BI but the data in DB that's why I say SQL is a very it's something that the moment you are expected to do more than reports in Excel, everybody expects you to interface with SQL. Even if you, for some roles where you use Excel intensely, you will still have to bring in data from SQL. When, let me rephrase that, for some roles where you need to create dynamic reports that can be refreshed automatically, you know, at that point too, even if nobody asks you for it, you want to connect your Excel to a SQL DB rather than just downloading and exporting data you know, exporting and downloading data, copy pasting them into the Excel. So SQL is something that I will say it's now like part of the data literacy tools. The same way everybody expects us to understand a language. Let's say you work in a in a country where the the business language is is English. Everybody expects you to understand English. Not maybe extremely fluent, but they don't want it to be that that's the the roadblock they are facing, they are not able to understand what you are saying, you are not understanding what they are saying. So SQL is becoming like that, like the English or the business language of a data analyst. 
So you need to know it. That's for sure if you call yourself a data analyst. Then back to my scenario. In the Power BI report that we create to support the business team, there are we need to do validation because we're in a finance, uh, it's a pension industry. So it's it's all figures and any mistake it's 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 not it's different from your browsing so spotify and you are seeing something different from what you search for you know that is forgivable there is no impact that you know it's oversized but for dealing with money just like in the banking scenario any report that is created has to be very very you know people have to be certain that what's there is correct because any that is wrong in it can have outsized impact so that's how critical the reports are so we do validation and we find out sometimes that you know some things are not the way they should be and uh, before i joined the team you know that process used to take a lot of time because we're essentially comparing what we have in the final p power bi generated reports with what the business have on the db you know, before a lot of transformations and data pipelines were in between the DB and the, I mean, between the original source and 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 the report on Power BI, and so it used to take a, let me just say, it used to take like days for all the reports. And what did I do with SQL? I was able to use SQL to a bit of subquery, commutable expressions, but SQL, just the same SQL that you discuss covers, to create the, replicate the exact transformation in Power BI, replicate it on the DB level and see what's coming out of the DB and then be able to, rather than wasting time, you know, randomly checking things and figuring out what the difference is, we could instantly in minutes see why if what I have on Power BI is matching what's in the DB, which is one level of validation, then now see what if what's on the DB is matching what's the original source from the business team, you know, because the business team also has another view that we could cross check things with. So in minutes, we could instantly see those. But now these reports are quarterly reports. So now I'm seeing that I could have just created a, a start procedure, put a, a variable of um, a parameter of dates because I always need to change dates. Yeah. Maybe put a parameter of which we check by region and by and by region and sector. I could put parameters for that and that's it. I will just save it. And what will happen is anytime we do these processes, I will have that subquery there. I can hand it over to someone else. Anybody can use it. I can show yeah. the business analyst and anybody can use it. And without me, been taking the full burden of the validation, you know, it becomes an institutionalized process. So, you know, there are always ways to use these things. It's just one being able to connect the dots and exposing oneself to webinars like these, where you're able to, without pressure, see someone explain this thing and begin to think about, okay, you know, I've never used it this way, or, you know, this is refreshing. And so, Thank you for joining and uh, I will say if you're interested in improving your SQL to a level where you know you understand it is just to apply that remains which application happens with the job you know there is no training that can make you become as good as someone who has been learning it who has been using it for five years but a training can let you understand what you need to know and then the only thing will just be you applying it and it's a conscious effort to apply, but you won't see something and not be able to understand it. You won't search online and just be blindly copying other people's um, code without understanding what's even happening there or even if what they've written, you know, it's the ideal thing for you. So that's what training, you know, it builds that bedrock. And I would say don't uh, ever just substitute a proper training with you know random online searches on youtube here and there they are never the same you know so yeah uh any questions more for for akim before we we round to this session so we don't have a power bi session this is the only session for today i'm going to share in the link um i'll share a way for you to give us feedback. Let's see where it's that. And also where you can access the community. 
Maybe what I'll do is I'll start methodologically. I'm going to share my screen. I hope I shared the right screen today, <laughs> so I don't give work to the to my team member where it is the video. Okay, yeah, I'm sharing the right thing. So um, I'm hoping many of you are aware, but maybe you are not aware. We've got a community page. You know, this is where you will see the schedules of the of the meetup. So this is the webinar community page. I'm putting it in the chat. Make sure you join if you have not joined. And that way you will always be in the loop. Every week it will send you automa automated um, notification of what session is happening that week, you know. So that's this. And um, in addition, mm, we've been having sessions since 20, the COVID year, that's 2020. Oh, wow, it's almost four years now. And uh, you can always watch the recordings. Even this one will be on that rec on the YouTube by tomorrow. So you can access the recording of our past sessions on this YouTube link. Uh, there's one more thing. So I already entered, but if you need training, you want your company to, you want to recommend us to your company, you know, uh, you feel more comfortable with the quality of what we do, or you at least know us now. It's not a case of a faceless entity that is just sending you proposal and everybody's going to promise you amazing things, but uh, it's not about promises, it's about delivery, right? So if you want to recommend us to your company, your friends, your relatives, your contacts, you know, who you know are need, looking for a place to learn these things from the doers, people who that's what they do day in, day out. We only do a few number of courses. It's not because we don't have opportunity to do project management, business analysis, IT security, cyber security. The temptation is always there, but the truth is we know we cannot give the quality that we want to give if we spread ourselves too thin. And so the only way we can achieve the kind of quality we want is to just focus on data analysis, focus on the tools that people can learn from us and they can easily get value in their career. And so what that means is, um, means we decided to narrow down on what is relevant in the industry, what we are knowledge experts on, and uh, what we can help our participants after the training to keep improving up. That's why this webinar you are joining us in today, you know, that's how it came to be. It was part of a support, uh, package for our training attendees our offerings uh, so that's what we we tell people that when you come for our training you are essentially paying for for a guarantee that you know that excel that power bi that would be the only training you you need to take why because you will take the training and you will be part of our on continuous learning process, these webinars, other things we do, we send out assignments every week, tasks every week. We have this ecosystem where as long as you are active, you don't even have to be active in everything. If you're active into third of all of what we involve you in, even what they released after you learned the Power BI, you will be aware of it because we are always having new. Uh, let me show you some of the sessions that have happened before now and you will see the at the speakers we've had and this is excel there's also for power bi so if i go uh okay because i didn't log in it didn't show but at least you can see that these are topics that some of them are recent they are if you are taking our course four years ago three years ago these things didn't exist and then you you join this webinar, you do other things, you are put in our WhatsApp group, you are active in attempting the assignments, the practices we sent, we email to you. Again, you don't have to do everything, just doing two thirds of it. You will move from whatever level you are before you came for the training. You know, you did the training, you became better. Let's say you became better by, let's just put some numbers, you became better by 100, 100, whatever factor we want to call it. You see, 
the if you keep doing all of these, you attend the webinar, you attempt the you join the webinar maybe three weeks in four weeks in a month, thrice in a month, not even all the days or all the weeks of the month. Let's say you attend three times a month instead of the entire three to four, I mean four to five times because some weeks are five weeks. You attempt, you know, seven out of the ten weekly tasks we send. You are part of the WhatsApp community. In six months, you would have gone from 100 to in, a, in an equivalent metric, 300. Why? Most of the learning will be much more by participating in these activities than even what you got from the paid training, the one that was what when you are being invoiced, being sold the training, that was what you focus your attention on. The truth is you will learn more even after the training from us than from the training because, you know, we are only one person or two people max teaches you during the training. But in these ones we have, you know, in six months you will probably have experienced trainings from dozens of people, different topics, different angles. You ask questions, it's one hour at a time. So what you learn sinks in versus when you learn like seven topics in one day versus, you know, you learn one topic in one hour. You can see that that one thing you learn in one hour is going to sink in more because there is a gap between you come back when you come back again next week, you learn another thing. And uh, that's the thing with learning. It's a continuous process. It's like driving. You go to driving school, they give you a certificate that you are now, you know, you have been tutored on how to drive in. But everybody knows that until you start driving six months consistently, you know, actively, you are still a learner. That certificate is just to check the list that somebody has taken you through all what you need to know. So it's the same thing too with learning IT skills, you know. The organized training is important, but it is not everything. If you ask me, I think it is even less than 50%. More than 50% is in, is in what you do after the training, what you do in two ways. The other things you keep exposing yourself to, like this webinar, and how you take the learning back to your work. So even that one is more critical because what you don't apply, it's just going to be there like like something you read in a book and you maybe accept you go for who wants to win a millionaire. It will never be valuable because you are not using it. You know, so it's the application that effectively solidifies the knowledge. All right, so I've done a lot of sales talk now, but uh, I hope you've gotten the message. So please, Try to be part of the community. Check us out if you need our trainings and uh, see you again next week. Thanks a, thanks a lot, Akim. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure. Me, uh, let me even see if I can find the feedback form link to share. But if I don't find it all well, uh, let me ha let you have a wonderful Sunday rest and have a wonderful week ahead. Uh, okay, I've seen it, so I'm just going to just share it now. And... Uh, that will be the last thing I will do before I end this session. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we hope that we'll see you next week. Thank you. Have a wonderful week ahead. Bye.